So today I have another paper uh, from the history of mathematics and a book related to that paper. This one is from 1948 and it's called A Mathematical Theory of Communication, written by Claude Shannon. Now, Claude Shannon isn't that famous. It's not a household name like Einstein or even Alan Turing, but he is responsible for many, many important things, including most of the information theory that exists today and most of the laws and ideas that govern uh, what information is, how you can compress information, how you can encode and decode information. He basically started this field with this paper and it's a lengthy paper although it's somewhat approachable i know i'm just telling this because i could at least read it through it's much bigger than alan turing's paper that we discussed a few video videos before uh, but it's less tedious let's say it's 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 a, it's a lengthy paper meaning it's almost like a book you can think of it as a textbook about information theory and um, he starts with many interesting ideas and although it's a mathematical paper he also talks about everyday notions like language uh, the meaning inside of english language how much stuff can you express in a certain amount of information and by thinking about those things and by doing some uh, experiments and just thought experiments and actual experiments he tries to get to the idea of what information is because this is 1940s and 50s and of course information in some sort of encoded format already existed they had books and papers and uh, telegraph and radio and television etc so they knew how to send signals and express inf express information in some ways that aren't direct so they had a, ideas of sending for example radio waves waves and encoding human speech into radio waves but there wasn't any notion of information that is almost natural to us today because today we know for sure that any sort of information can be encoded in the most basic form in, in binary form and for us it's kind of obvious that this sound that I make and the video that is being recorded and text that is on the screen, all those different forms of information are just different forms of the same idea. It's just information and it all can be encoded and decoded uh, in the same way. Back then, this idea wasn't that obvious. It wasn't natural to think of information being universal. So you had sound and you had text and you had some code and they, you can't think of them as just absolutely separate things. Yes, they are all about information, but they kind of fundamentally different forms. So Shannon, among other things, wanted to think about maybe information is some sort of universal property and it can be rigorously explained and explored and uh, defined mathematically. And when you do that, you then have some new features. You have abilities to express that information, analyze it, and maybe tell something about the kind of density of meaning. And this is an interesting idea because uh, when you think about human languages, let's say English versus Russian, if you just take the same book, for example, this book, which is in English and is this thick, so it's like, uh, let's say, 230 pages. If you find the, this book in Russian, if you find the official translation, so it's not an interpretation, not a different book, this exact book, but translated into Russian as literally uh, nice as possible, I bet it's gonna be longer. It's gonna be at least 10, 15% longer. And you can attribute this to cultural things and the way people talk, but generally, Russian language is less dense than English. Meaning to express the same thing, to just express the same idea, you usually need more words, or at least the words themselves are longer. So on average, a word has more characters. 
you might think, well, sure, and there are some shorter languages, I guess, and some really long ones. So that's just history. Yes, but if you are expressing the same idea in different ways by different amount of words or let's say bytes or bits, that means there must be some limit, right? There, there must be like the minimum amount of bits and you cannot go lower because if you go lower, it's going to be nonsense. So there must be some sort of lower limit of how dense information can be packed into symbols, be it words or digits or, or numbers or whatever. If you have this idea and you somehow define mathematically that limit, which Shannon does in this paper, then you can ask a question, well, let's say English, how dense is it? In a way, can you make it smaller and still be able to express ideas? And actually, this is an interesting experiment because if you just remove random letters from uh, a text, let's say you remove 10% of random letters, most English speakers will still be able to understand this. Uh, they might not even notice in some instances that a letter is missing because our brains are really good at filling the blanks. So once we know what the words are, uh, we can read with mistakes, basically. Or even when we speak, or let's say when British people speak, uh, they for some reason just forget that the letter T is, you know, a pronounceable letter. So they say things like British and Twitter, and we still understand them, well, most of the time. And, uh, well, you can just forget about that letter then. It, you don't have to pronounce it and you still express the same amount of information. Now, there are a lot of different topics here, right? This is about prior knowledge and expectation and this pattern recognition. But fundamentally, the idea is there. The idea is that any sort of format for expressing information can be of different density. So it can be of different sort of expressive power and effectiveness. Now, I can make up a language which will be enormous. Like you say hello uh, in 11 words. And that would be a really inefficient way to communicate. But that's interesting. Like you can think of this as a mathematical notion and then think about it and make some predictions about what that would look like. Now, why am I talking about this? Why information? Sure. sure. It's interesting, but uh, it's not just about information in forms of encoding or human language or messaging, etc. It turns out information is tightly the idea of information, the idea of this denseness and effectiveness of formats of information is really, really tightly connected to fundamental physical notions, the properties of the universe. It turns out information is the key that might describe some fundamental properties of the universe. And it's tightly related to the ideas of entropy in physics. There's also the notion of entropy in information theory, which is kind of, in a sense, the opposite of entropy in physics. But it's, it's not a coincidence that Shannon actually wanted to use that term in his paper to describe certain properties of information. It's not a coincidence because that same term describes some properties of the universe, of physical systems. With the ideas of information, you can describe things that, that you had troubles describing before, like black holes. And some properties of information turn out to be fundamental properties of the universe. For example, you cannot destroy information. Now, yeah, I can, you know, burn a hard drive or like this paper. Uh, there's a lot of information in, in it expressed in English letters and words. I can burn this book. So I'm. you might say I just destroyed information. But it turns out, according to physics, I didn't destroy it. Even if I burned this book, I wouldn't have destroyed the information encoded in all the letters and all the molecular connections and atomic properties, all kinds of information that in this physical object, starting from this high level human language and finishing with 
all the configuration of atoms and elementary particles that describe this object. Even when I seemingly destroy this object, this information is not destroyed. It's just transferred into other forms, into heat, into whatever comes out of that fire. And in principle, I can reverse this. So meaning if I capture the whole process of burning this book, if, I, if it's possible to capture everything about burning this book, every single interaction of every single particle, then it's in principle possible to reverse that and restore the book as it was. Now, that is absolutely counterintuitive. But if that's true, there are many interesting implications. When it comes to things like black holes, this idea is in trouble because, well, if you throw something into a black hole, you lose it forever, kind of, right? It's not like burning, so you, you just don't have access to it anymore. So you might, you might say, well, that's information being destroyed. But no, black holes just stay there and you can say, well, it's, it wasn't destroyed. It's inside, it's inaccessible, but information wasn't destroyed. And that was a fine explanation for a long time. But then Hawking proved that black holes actually evaporate. So if you wait long enough, a black hole shrinks and just disappears. So now, whatever went in, all the books, all the particles, all the matter that went into the black hole is lost. So you can still destroy information this way? Now, this is an interesting question in physics, and they try to answer it in many different ways, and it's still somewhat a hot topic. Uh, so maybe in this process of evaporation, information actually escapes somehow, or maybe the information is encoded into some other form. But there's no question about the impossibility of destroying information. Somehow our universe just doesn't allow information to be destroyed. It can be transferred and hidden and transformed, but you cannot destroy it. Why? Now, this goes beyond the ideas of, you know, human language and knowledge. By information, in this sense, we mean any sort of meaningful configuration. So if you just have like a particle and it's in certain configuration, like it's quote unquote looking up or looking down or spinning counterclockwise or something, some property that is information. And you can combine this into more complex ideas. Like you have, you can combine particles and say they form a pattern like up, down, up. So it's kind of like one, zero, one or X, Y, X, whatever, some pattern that's also information. So any sort of knowledge you can derive from a system is considered information. And in this, the broadest sense, information in, is indestructible in the universe. Now, this whole long rambling is because I want to recommend this book. And this book is called Why Information Grows. And it's written by Cesar Hidalgo. And it's, it's a really cool book and really nice cover also. It talks about information. And yes, it tries to answer the question of why information grows. Now, we said information is indestructible, but it's also kind of an observed property that once you have information in some sort of closed system like Earth or our economy, it tends to grow. And the interesting thing is it tends to grow in lumps. Like if you look at the global economy, it's not homogeneous. There are spots where economy and systems and people and industries and all other things of all other kinds of information grow in different spots. But there are also vast areas where nothing grows or actually it reduces. In this book, the author tries to answer this question, why information grows? Why does it grow in lumps? Uh, and how you can analyze such global things like economy through the lens of information. Now, ultimately, it's kind of about global economy, but it's not a book about world economy. It gets there in the last part. So it's like in the last 30%, it gets to the global economy. Uh, 
it feels like that's the ultimate goal. That's why he's moving towards that topic. But for me, the most interesting part was before that. Uh, all the parts about information, about Claude Shannon, about his paper, about black holes, about the universe, about bits and bytes. And uh, slowly from these fundamental physical and universal properties, he moves to the idea of systems like organic systems, like trees. Trees are sort of computers. They store information because they can, and they are computers beca because they react to input and they have programmed behavior in them. For example, a tree reacts to the change in weather and when it's cold, it, it changes the color of the leaves and the chemical compounds. And there are programmed behaviors built in into organic uh, entities. So from there, he moves to the idea that people's brains are, of course, also computers, but they also tend to operate on information in interesting ways. And if you think of brains as idea generators and idea processors, idea parsers, then suddenly you have this lump of organic matter that somehow transforms bad information into good information, into useful information. Useless streams of information, as in just unorganized matter and ideas around us, into organized matter, into objects, into properties. And it's interesting to think about this because, well, if your brain is a generator of ideas, a generator of patterns, it's kind of a computer and a hard disk which stores information and can act on this information to create new objects in the universe. So even though on average the whole universe tends to increase in entropy, meaning it just dissolves into homogeneous matter, on average that's true. So on average things go into disorder and chaos. But in those spots, in, in those, again, lumps of order as Earth or any other planet for that matter, or a human being, we kind of go in reverse. We decrease entropy. We create order out of disorder and we destroy chaos, at least for limited amount of time. From this idea, from the idea of people as processors of information, he tries to, to build on onto systems thinking and get to the point of thinking uh, about nations and companies as processors of information. And then think about global economy and why it is as it is, why it grows in lumps and why it grows at all through the lens of information. Now, this is an interesting take because information seems to be the universal gluing concept that can explain many different complex systems such as quantum physics, black holes, cosmology, human behavior, uh, global economy, and any large system at that. So Why Information Grows, really good book. Uh, it's easy in a way that it's really approachable, so you don't need any math background or anything. It's, not, it's a popular science book. And this guy, Cesar Hidalgo, he also has a few lectures on YouTube. And one of the lectures, or a few guest lectures, I guess, are uh, about this book. So he talks about some of the chapters of this book, and he kind of explains parts of this book. So uh, you can start with that, and if you like it, then get the book. All right, thanks.